Our next guest still has like 34 years to go until she's 64. Senator Patricia Rucker, good morning to you. How are you? I just want to know how you would know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at your picture. I assume you're 30 years old, Patricia. Right. Okay. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good morning. Thank Welcome back. Thank you. I'm very happy to be back home. The uh, the Senate side, uh, toward the end of the session, uh, uh, I don't, I'm sure I'll use the word circus or not. I guess it became a little uh, adventurous during those, uh, those final two days, Patricia. Yeah, it was interesting. I'm, I prefer that word. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, can you, can you, you're the first senator I've spoken with since the session ended. Can you tell us? Well, I know Robert Carnes, Senator Carnes, was in the middle of this. Can you tell us what happened? So um, from an outside view, I can tell you that um, Senator Carnes decided that morning to request that the bills be read, which is actually uh, allowed to any uh, legislator. It's in the state constitution that bills be read. We have to, you know, every single day basically request unanimous consent to not read the bills. So he decided he wanted the bill to be read. The first time that he asked for it, it was at the inappropriate time. Then he waited for the appropriate time, and the Senate president refused to um, acknowledge him. And so he decided to, um, you know, get louder and louder requesting it. And um, it was, it, I will tell you, it was definitely uh, hard to listen to, very, very uh, uncomfortable. And I, I really didn't know what was going to happen. Then it got... You know, we, we were recessed or, or at ease. I can't remember right now. And uh, one of my fellow senators was so upset about it all that he walked out and I followed him to, to talk to him and, and, hey, you know, what's going on? Uh, turns out he was very upset about what was going on. And while I was out, they went back into session. And I'm sure everyone in the whole state, you know, saw what happened next, which was that Donna Bowley made a motion to um, remove Senator Carnes for disorderly conduct, and the Senate president, uh, I guess, approved the motion, accepted the motion, and he was removed for the rest of the day. Was, and, and I know Senator Carnes would be the better person to ask this question, but was this Senator Carnes insisting that the Constitution be followed with the appropriate number of readings and such, or was this really a personal battle between he and Senator Blair? I'm aware of the fact that they don't get along that well. It, I definitely prefer that he speak for himself, but I will tell you that there were um, many members of the um, Senate that were very unhappy with things that had been occurring um, it, within the 24 hours of when that happened. Um, there were several that were just taken aback and completely unaware that a motion to discharge supported by the leadership was going to occur. And when that happened, and this was the previous evening, um, there was a lot of upset folks. And um, it's really unfortunate that you know, folks do not feel like they can go to the Senate president and talk about um, how upset they are. I believe that eventually did happen. Folks did go, but not until after this incident with Senator Carnes. So was was Carnes representing the viewpoints of many senators who did not speak up, it sounds like you're saying? Well, I definitely think he did represent some senators who were upset. I don't, I'm not saying that they approved what he did. I don't think it was in any way planned by anyone except for Senator Carnes. I know I myself, um, when I had an indication that Senator Carnes might do this, I tried to dissuade him from it. Obviously unsuccessfully. What were his, what were his reasons for remaining, uh, I guess, focused on carrying this out? I mean, he felt it was, it was, um, he was just very upset that there had to be some reaction to that discharge motion um, to basically res resurrect a bill that had died in committee without first discussing it in, in caucus. And, and what was the reason for resurrecting the bill without first discussing it in caucus? What was the, was it the urgency of the time left? You would, ha you would have to ask the leadership. I mean, obviously, it would, it would have to have passed that day in order for it to pass this session. 
So there was some urgency. They, it was their intent to pass it. But I will tell you that I, I never um, got any indication from anyone in leadership that they wanted that bill to pass except for um, the judiciary chair. And so the judiciary chair was the only one who had expressed his desire to run the bill because he had made a promise to run the bill. But we never had that indication from any of um, the caucus or leadership. And um, that, that, I would say, was disappointing. Just as being a, a member of a team, that we did not have mm-hmm. any discussion, any direction. And, um, and I believe that, you know, that was made clear to the Senate president. But like I said, unfortunately, um, Senator Carnes, you know, he, he decides to do things um, his own way sometimes. And uh, although I did not, did not want that to happen, I almost felt like it was inevitable something was going to happen because of how upset some people were. We have the Senate President, Craig Blair, scheduled for later this week. We had the Judiciary Chairman, Senator Charlie Trump, scheduled yesterday. He missed his interview with us, so we didn't get a chance to get his take on how this whole thing proceeded and uh, what the the urgency was uh, to get that bill uh, in front of uh, the caucus there. Right, right. So. I did speak with um, Senator Trump personally about it. And I will tell you, I, I definitely was upset. I was upset that there was no discussion, no direction. Um, I obviously am not someone who could do what Senator Carnes did, and that's not the way I, I think things should be handled. But um, but I did feel that there was a failure to communicate with us. Matt Miller. Is it a black eye, if you will, on what was otherwise a good session? How would you evaluate the session as a whole? So I would say this is this was a pretty, you know, mixed session. We had some incredible successes. Um, it was, you know, I'm very, very grateful that we finally got some tax reform and a little bit of tax relief. Um but there were some notable failures, too. So, you know, I, w- I would say overall it was a mixed session. And, yeah, it was unfortunate that that occurred on the second to last day. But um, overall, though, it didn't really interfere with us getting the work done that the people asked us to do. You mentioned the tax cuts. W- were you pleased with how that went? Um, I know early on, obviously, the House, if you will, maybe calling the bluff of the Senate president with the 50 percent. They they put out that big plan and and the Senate came back and you know, uh, that's not going to be workable. You finally got it down to what did pass. Are you pleased with that? I, I, I would have been happier if it had been a larger um, tax decrease, um, if we had, you know, kept to a 30 percent reduction um having said that i understand and i've said this a thousand times on your show rob like this is the process right so you you know that it's going to change you introduce you know an idea and it goes back and forth and there's uh, 134 people that have their own ideas and you try to end with something that you can live with so it's it's not as good as i would have liked um i'll be honest but i am pleased that we at least passed something and that it has um triggers to do further reductions in the future yeah and is that a key component to you i know delegate larry kump was on in our first segment here today and he commented about how he appreciated the fact that future cuts can come based on some controls and so forth is that a part that you do like I do like that part, yes. Do you see those coming in the near future based on the economic projections in the state? Well, I mean, some of it, I I would say yes, based on the faith I have on the policies we've adopted in West Virginia, but it's not going to be wholly dependent on that, unfortunately. I think what's going on nationally is going to have an economic impact in West Virginia. We have a national government that is spending more than it should. There doesn't seem to be any end in sight, no um, self-control. We have um, a lot of rumblings in the banking industry that is making a lot of people concerned. And, And I believe a lot of the things going on nationally are going to just cause folks who you know, may want to invest or grow their businesses to wait and see. And, of course, that's something that we don't necessarily control. 
Patricia. John Bodwell. Hey, Patricia, let me ask this. Were there some things, specific things that you wanted to see pass, that you wanted to see happen this session that did not happen in the Senate and overall? Um, yes, I, I, I would say yes, although, um, again, I, I, I never expect, you know, I get everything through. I'm very pleased that so much of my um, legislation did complete um, and get through, so I don't want to just be negative. <laughs> No, no, of course. Can can you give us some examples of things you wanted to see that didn't happen that you're hoping maybe see maybe happen next year? I'll be happy to. Uh, it's kind of funny. Like it was we talked earlier in the uh, beginning of the session. I had several bills regarding vaccinations and vaccination, you know, accepting religious freedom. Um, you would call it to to allow for religious exemptions, which almost all the states in the United States um, accept. That didn't go through. We I had a bill just to do a study. Um, let the Bureau of Public Health um, just keep track of any adverse reactions to vaccines, so that we actually have state specific data. And that did not um, even get discussed. Um, I was disappointed. I had some very basic bills that was requested by constituents here in the Eastern Panhandle that um, died that wouldn't, didn't even have fiscal notes. I just don't even understand it. One was um, to have a discussion on the funding of adult education, which right now currently is at the will and pleasure of what the State Board of Education wants to give them. But we have excellent adult education center here in Jefferson and Berkeley. And you cannot run a business without having some steady income that you know is coming in. And so they're literally year by year, like, just they just don't know. They have no idea. Are we going to get the same funding? Are we going to get, you know, cut funding? And it's all just based on what's, you know, determined to be given to them. And and I I just wanted to have a discussion. Should we do that differently? That failed. Um, Very... Basic bill I've tried for two years to pass that had to do with removing the um, monopoly of the vocational tech um, centers like James Ramsey that doesn't allow local public high schools to do their own voc ed um, if they choose to and if they have the funding for it. And so, again, doesn't cost any money. All it did was remove the current monopoly that you can't do it. And that failed again to pass. So, you know, there's some disappointments there. Um, I, I was um, unhappy that uh, 2007, uh-huh. which I know is a controversial bill regarding um, transgender surgery and um, trying to protect minors um, and give them the opportunity to grow before they make decisions that could affect their entire lives. I was disappointed with the amendment that occurred in the Senate on the second to last day um that um just Uh i feel kind of just it ruined the the purpose of the bill it no longer um provides that protection for children so that was disappointing to me also getting back to adult education is it uh, are those funded by the state board of education or is it each individual local board funds the adult education in each county so it there there is no set rule so I believe there is some funding from the State Board of Education to adult education, and then the local counties can choose to also give the adult education centers in the local county some funding also. I know that in Jefferson County, um, I believe they get a certain amount of the excess levy that got passed by voters. I think a certain amount goes to adult education. but. We're talking about, um, again, an organization that has staff, that has a building, that provides an uh, incredible service to our, you know, kids and and all adults here in Jefferson County. And they, year by year, do not have um, any basic allowance that they know they will receive. And um, I just feel that's not the right way of doing it. I think that it makes it impossible to, to plan ahead, to plan programs, to have some, any sort of continuity. Um, exactly. ho- oh, hopefully that's it. something you can get across the finish line next year. Oh, and I should mention another huge disappointment. I know for the entire Eastern Panhandle, there was both a House and a Senate version of a study for the cost of living adjustment to state salary. And uh, it passed the Senate unanimously. 
but for some reason, the House of Delegates could not get that through, and that was a huge disappointment to all of us. Yeah, and that didn't even involve any money. There was no fiscal note for that okay. bill. That was just the study of it, and they wouldn't even entertain that. I think that failed 52-45 in the House, if I recall. Senator Rucker is the uh, chair of, the, of School Choice, by the way, serves on Health and Human Resources, Judiciary, and uh, Outdoor Recreation, too. Uh, I want to ask you about this marriage bill that was working its way through in regards to those under 18. And I think some yeah. type of compromise was reached about age 16. They, I guess, yeah. well, so, yeah, explain this to me because I couldn't find it to read more on it. Okay, it's um, House Bill 3018, 3018, and we uh, amended it on the floor to essentially be that it still allowed ages 16 and 17 with a parent's permission, um, but it sets a floor of 16. It also um, said that 16 and 17 year olds could not marry someone that was four years, more than four years older. So a 16 year old could marry an 18 year old, but isn't or, that. Or t- up to a 20 year old. Up to a but 20. We- Right. That we were not going to allow for more than a four-year difference. Why, why did we allow this law to continue? Why do we allow 16- and 17-year-olds to marry when, strictly by the legal definition of the law, a 19-year-old has sex with a 16-year-old, you can be jailed for statutory rape, whether it's consensual or not? Well, actually, no, that's not totally true. So the age of consent in the state of West Virginia is at 16. It's at 16. Yes. Okay. That sounds and, like it's probably a bit archaic, though. I'm going to guess that goes back a few years. I, I would assume so, but we haven't changed that yet. And one of the one of the issues, I think, for folks who were discussing that uh, legislation is the understanding that when you forbid marriage, it's not a changing or affecting the actual uh, sexual activities of young people. And that often does lead to pregnancy. So to be perfectly frank, you are allowing or permitting, um, you know, obviously can't really stop uh, underage um, sexual activity that leads to pregnancy, but you are saying you're not allowed to actually get married if that is the result. And there were folks that, you know, they do have issues with that. Um, If the young people do want to to get married, why would you stop them from doing that? Well, but that logic, though, if I could follow that out to saying, well, you know, murder is illegal, but it still happens. So why don't we just legalize murder when it happens with, you know, 16 and 17 year olds? I mean, well, that's, that's, that's the, actually, the logic of that. Fall, it fails me because just because they're going to do it doesn't mean we should make it legal. Well, we're talking about marriage and marriage in and of itself is not a bad institution that's you can't say marriage is the same as murder no um, but the, so i'm mar- using the logic that they're there that you're giving me on that one well that again, they're going to do it anyway so if you if you are one of those young people that got pregnant and you are expecting a child and you're 16 or 17 your boyfriend is 17 or 18 we're saying that that original bill would have said you are not allowed to get married even if you want to, even if your parents say, yes, we're okay with it, we will support it, you're not allowed to. So there were those who felt that that was just too much. That's too much and, and unrealistic. There are many of us that have stories of family members who were in that situation, did get married, have continued to stay married, have been married their entire lives, have had good lives, why would we, the state, decline it as a, just a random, we set this um, age? And I know, of course, that it is much better for young people to not get in that situation. It's much better for them to finish school, much better for them to, you know, start their careers before they start their families. But it's, it's not the necessary path. There are other paths that have also been successful. And the state needs to determine all of those considerations when they make a decision to say something, nope, we're just not going to allow. 
And uh, you may know that other states have different ages. Some right. are 18, but some are 16. Um, I think 16 is probably the most common age. And so, again, what are we saying? Um, okay, young people, you, you're in this situation. You can hop over to Virginia where the age is 16 and leave the state in order to do it. I mean, we have to take those things into account. Well, my argument to that would be these are not legal adults. You know, eight, that, it may be the age of consent, but 18 is the age of being a legal adult, is it not? That That is absolutely true. And again, I will tell you, even at the age of 18, um, we had uh, many things we don't allow 18-year-olds to know. do. You can't so drink. That's, that's exactly right. We're going to smoke. 16-year-olds at their wedding, they can't toast with champagne. They'll get arrested. The sparkling apple cider. That's right. Uh, Senator Rucker, we went a little bit long on this. I appreciate your time this morning. Any final thoughts? Well, I'm sorry we didn't get to talk about any of the school choice bills because we did a lot of um, some more expansion there, which was great. Maybe some other time I can come and talk about it. Will you come back on next week and we can do a lot of school choice bill stuff? I would be happy to do so. I thank you very much. I'll send you a text. We'll settle a day. Great. You guys have a great day. You too. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. 